Attorney, civil rights advocate, and columnist Roger Wilkins has died. Wilkins was a native of Kansas City, Missouri, and the nephew of the late NAACP executive director Roy Wilkins. A University of Michigan Law School graduate, Wilkins worked in both the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. In the 1970s, Wilkins launched a career in journalism, becoming a regular columnist for both the New York Times and the Washington Post, also serving on their editorial boards. It was Wilkins' editorials uh, during the Watergate period that helped the Washington Post earn a Pulitzer Prize and bringing down the presidency of Richard Nixon. In his 1982 memoir, Roger Wilkins acknowledged struggling with being black and his unease and guilt over the relative privilege he enjoyed compared to many other African Americans. Here's a conversation between the late Julian Bond and Wilkins as, it, as they discuss his upbringing. Um, when you're in school in Grand Rapids and you're student council president, recognized by your peers as a leadership figure, uh, a model student, a leader, but deep down, you write, I guess I was also trying to demonstrate that I was not like those other people, that I was different. My message was quite clear. I was not nigger. Right. So describe the feeling that you have to demonstrate you're not like this despised other group of people, that you're different from and better than they. Um. Well, you don't simply get the concept of uh, shiftless nigger from, only from white people, although the culture surely was full of that. Mm -hmm. But there was a, as you know, a very sharp uh, class consciousness among blacks. Mm -hmm. And although my parents, um, none of the adults around whom I grew up, um, expressed those views, there was plenty among other black people. Um, and of course you knew, you, you knew and you saw poor black people and, uh, just up from the South and uh, who didn't behave in the way that uh, was acceptable to white culture. And I didn't want to be, I didn't, I just didn't want to be like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I want people to think it was like that, that, that I was, that I was different. I could, well, the old folks used to have a saying, the old black folks, they'd say, oh, you know, he, he's, he's just up from, he just up from the country. He doesn't know how to do. Mm -hmm. I wanted people to know that I knew how to you do. You knew how to do. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you. Uh, Roger Wilkins, of course, died Sunday in Maryland. He was 85 years old. Folks, what's interesting about uh, when you look at uh, his career, uh, advising Presidents uh, Kennedy and Johnson, uh, I interviewed him several times, but he talked about that pain of essentially uh, living in a white world. Uh, not having um, this, 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 this sort of black experience and having to deal with the expectations of whites. It was a, it's, it's a very interesting uh, career, William. When, when you, uh, Wilmer, when you think about uh, somebody who, prolific writer, uh, worked with the Ford Foundation, but lived sort of this dual life, if you will. Well, Du Bois talked about the veil and talked about the Tunis, and uh, he, and his generation. There were a lot of people within his generation that were firsts and, and trailblazers and were, were trying to fight that battle, uh, the external battle, while also trying to deal with the internal battle. And, you know, it, it's, it, it still exists today. It's not as obvious. It's not as prevalent. But again, he was of a generation uh, where they were, they were between two worlds. And, uh, and had to figure out how to manage and navigate in both. And, uh, and he did. And you quote Du Bois, I would quote France Fanon, we wear the mask that grins and lies, right? It is a very distinct dynamic, and we all know it. When you have to navigate the realities of white culture and white sort of expectations in the professional space, and your home, and your home culture. And you know, but what I think is important for us to realize and acknowledge is that they're both um, something that's not only real, but can be very stressful for that person. There have been surveys that have looked at 
not black people's perceptions of racism. And interestingly, probably counter what, to what most people would expect. Black people who are quote unquote middle class, who are highly educated, who are those people that quite frankly have to exist and persist in the white world, are the ones that are, seem to be most cognizant of racism. And I would argue it's because they deal with it and see it and have to navigate it every day. Here's what the New York Times said, but beyond attending a segregated elementary school as a boy and being arrested once in a protest against apartheid, Mr. Wilkins had little personal experience with discrimination. He waged war against racism from above the barricades with political influence, jawboning, court injunctions, philanthropic grants, legislative proposals, and commentaries on radio and television and in newspaper magazines and books. Uh, outwardly, he was a successful, popular black man with more white acquaintances than black friends. The second of his three wives was white, and they said that that, that weighed on him his entire life. Yeah, you know, I tell you, I've had the chance to get to know him because uh, I went to George Mason as well. This guy chose to be engaged in the battle. He could have lived this little suburban middle class life and lived the easy life, but he chose to keep that life, but also to be engaged with our struggles. And I find that fascinating about him. Absolutely. You know, th this also exists, of course, naturally in um, in corporate America. I experienced it firsthand, where you actually live that that uh, that corporate life, so to speak, at a level of duality, mm -hmm. where you have to navigate the nonsense in corporate America. <laughs> so you put on your suit, and then sometimes my friends, would, when I'm talking with my friends, they say, "All right, do you still have your suit on? Take your suit off." <laughs> 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 Listen that time. But but but, yeah. but it causes a lot of stress internally, yeah. and and sometimes it's not just what they say, it's it's the nonverbal communication, mm. all those cues as soon as you step in the room. Sure, sure. You know, yeah. you, you mentioned point. Uh, the, the stress, and, and Roland, you mentioned interviewing him a number of times, as did I, and you always got that sense that, that there was something there when you spoke to him. Uh, there, was, there, was, there was something there that there was always going on behind the scenes. You could tell right. when you talked to him that... <laughs> It's hard to describe, but he was not at ease. Right. That's true. Right. Right. And I also this here. There's also it was uh, an individual who uh, was accessible. Uh, his phone number remained in the Washington uh, D.C. phone directory. Mm -hmm. I remember when I, I, I ran into him somewhere, and I, I said, "Look, I said I want to get your number to interview me." He said, "Oh, I'm in the book." He said, no, no, really. He said, my number's in the book. He said, you can call information, and my number's there. I can be reached. Uh, folks, and uh, Shelly, go to my iPad. This is a cover of the autobiography, uh, A Man's Life, an autobiography, Roger Wilkins, uh, of course, written, published in 1982. Again, Roger Wilkins, dead at the age of 85, and certainly condolences go out to uh, his family. A peaceful protest turned deadly. 37-year-old black man was shot and killed by Baton Rouge police. His hands are in the air and you still get shot by the cops. Oh my God, please don't tell me he's dead. We're not gonna let hate define us. Race is a big part of this. If truly all lives matter, then all lives need to matter equally. What we require is action. What we require is accountability. We understand that black lives do matter. And we will keep focused on this issue. News One Now, every weekday morning at seven on TV One.